Hello everyone and welcome to the very first episode of Star Trek Tempest, a role-playing game podcast set in the Star Trek universe and using the Star Trek Adventures role-playing game system uh, published by Modifius. My name is Brian, I'm going to be the host, the game master, and the storyteller for uh, this campaign and this podcast. You might know me from a podcast from a few years ago called Down in Front, uh, and if you do, then you already know that I'm a huge nerd for Star Trek. A friend of mine recently introduced me to the role-playing game podcast genre, so I thought it'd be fun to get some of my nerd friends together and do one for the universe that I love the most, Star Trek. This is going to be more of an episode zero, where I'm going to talk about the premise and the setting a little bit, briefly go over the core mechanic that is in the Star Trek Adventures game system, and then we're going to top everything off with interviews with our four main players, uh, who will talk about the characters that they've created for the game. If you would rather skip this or come back to it later, feel free. Uh, just press pause on this and then go download episode one, which is Entropy's Demise, part one. Uh, and that's the beginning of actual gameplay and the start of the campaign proper. But if you're still with us, I'm going to take just a minute to describe uh, the setting and the premise. Uh, our players play the command crew of the starship USS Tempest, an ambassador-class starship in the year... Uh, 2339. The Tempest is a sister ship to the Enterprise C, which if you remember the episode Yesterday's Enterprise of the Next Generation, when the Enterprise that came immediately before Picard's falls through a time vortex and then changes history and has to be sent back in order to set history right, the past that it comes from and returns to is the present of our campaign. And the ship in our campaign, the Tempest, is a sister ship to the Enterprise C from that episode. So our campaign is set in the year 2339, which is about two-thirds of the way between Captain Kirk and the original series era and Captain Picard and the Next Generation era. The reason I wanted to set the campaign in this time period is because we know a lot about Captain Kirk and the era of the original series, and we know even more about Captain Picard in the era of Next Generation, and not just the Next Generation, but also Deep Space Nine and Voyager, but we don't know a lot about the time in between. So I thought it would be interesting to set a campaign in that time period and explore what might have been going on in that time period. Now I will say as a warning that this is a role-playing game, so the decisions and the choices that our players and characters make may cause events to unfold differently than what we see in the Next Generation era. So if there's a moment in our campaign where you think, well, it can't go that way because we know it's already like this in the Next Generation, don't necessarily think that because our campaign may go in a different direction. In effect, it may create its own history. Two examples of how that may go are with the Klingons and the Cardassians. Uh, if you remember Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, uh, you'll remember that in that movie, the Klingons and the Federation signed a peace treaty for the first time. Uh, in our campaign, we're building on that idea to say that that peace treaty was intended to last for 50 years and then would expire or be renewed at the end of 50 years, which will be just a few years into the future of our campaign. So at the time of our campaign, there's a question of whether or not the Federation can build a longer lasting, more solid peace with the Klingons, or if the Klingons are going to go back to their old warlike ways once the treaty expires. Uh, and some people in Starfleet and the Federation feel that war is inevitable and that Starfleet should be proactive about fighting the Klingons sooner rather than later. Another example is the Cardassians. Uh, first contact with them happened about 20 years before the start of the campaign. The Cardassians have behaved very aggressively for a long time, almost provoking Starfleet and the Federation to see how much they could get away with poking and prodding. And because of that, some people in Starfleet feel that war with the Cardassians is also inevitable. There's also the aspect of the Bajoran occupation, which if you saw Deep Space Nine, then you know that the Cardassians occupied the planet of Bajor, an occupation which ended at the beginning of that series. In our campaign, that occupation is ongoing, and some people in Starfleet and the Federation feel like they should do something about it, and maybe even fight to free Bajor from the Cardassian occupation and free its people from the oppression that they're experiencing. So those are just a couple of quick examples of what the setting of the Star Trek universe is like at this moment in time, and how things may play out the same or differently on a big scale with respect to the rest of the Star Trek lore. And I also posed those as questions for our players and their characters to see how their characters feel about all of those topics, as well as how they feel about the Prime Directive. If you're a Star Trek fan, then you know that the Prime Directive is this very important guiding principle that says that the Federation and Starfleet will not 
interfere or meddle with the development of cultures that haven't reached a certain point. Now some characters in Star Trek feel that this is incredibly important and must be adhered to at all costs, even at the cost of maybe your life or your ship or your crew, and that it's almost a sacred kind of precept that Starfleet and the Federation must uphold. We've seen other people in Star Trek who, when confronted with a certain situation, may try to find uh, a loophole or skirt the letter of the law to do what they feel is right, even if it doesn't stick to what the Prime Directive actually demands. And sometimes characters feel both ways about it, depending on the episode. But before we jump into the player and character interviews, I want to take just a quick moment to describe the core game mechanic that's at the center of the Star Trek Adventure system. There's a lot of nooks and crannies to these rules. I'm not going to get into every aspect of them here now. I'm just going to describe the core mechanic, and then we'll go over other things as they come up in gameplay. Uh, but the core mechanic in Star Trek Adventures is what's called the task. So anytime a character wants to do something, they have to attempt a task to see if they succeed or fail at it. So each character has six attributes and six disciplines, and there's a point value that goes with each of those. An attribute is something like reason, fitness, presence, stuff like that. Disciplines are the different departments that you would find on a starship. So there's command, there's con, which is piloting ability, engineering, security, science and medicine. You take the relevant attribute and discipline and you add them together and that gives you the target number that you have to roll. So say for example you are an engineer in engineering on your starship and you're trying to track down some problem in the ship systems. So that would be an attribute of reason and a discipline of engineering. Say those two values added together gives you a value of 12. So you would roll some number of d20s and any d20 that rolled 12 or under would count as a success. Every task has a difficulty level attached to it, usually between 0 and 5, and the difficulty level equals the number of d20s that you have to roll at or below your target number. So in this example, if the task is a difficulty level 1, you have to roll at least one d20 that is at your target number or less. By default, a player rolls two d20s for any task, and if the task is a higher difficulty level than two, there are various ways to add more dice to that rule or otherwise improve your odds. Again, we're not going to go into each and every different possibility. We will cover them as they come up in gameplay because there's a lot of them. Momentum is essentially a currency that the players have to improve their odds or to make their lives easier in attempting a task. And threat is the counterpart to that. It's a currency that the Game Master uses to make life more difficult for the players. There are also things like talents, values, determination, one character assisting another in a task, Again, we will go over those as they come up in the game. So that's the basics of the rules. Uh, now we're going to jump into the player character interviews and learn about the characters that our players have created for themselves. Commander TJ Goodspeed is the Tempest Executive Officer, the, the number one of the ship. Uh, so tell us a little bit about who TJ Goodspeed is. I'm a human, as you can probably tell. Uh, I was born in uh, 2305. Um, both my parents worked in Starfleet. Uh, Dad was a Starfleet engineer, and we bounced from shipyard to shipyard. I was born at the uh, 40 Eridani Starfleet construction yards in the Vulcan system. Which is, which is Vulcan, right? Yeah. yeah, 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 Vulcan system. So, you know, we'd spend time on Vulcan all the time, and you know, that's why I kind of hate heat and uh, always keep a room <laughs> cool if I have a choice. I'm really I'm good at engineering, and you know how, like, there's when some starships when they accelerate to warp they have that little jolt uh and and now yep. more recently those starships don't have that uh that's because uh that's because of me i designed the latest inertial dampers that we're using as a standard in starfleet now i designed those if you ever look on a display and and notice uh a gs dampener that's that's me a good speed dampener <laughs> that's i love i love that detail that's awesome so Goodspeed is the first officer of the Tempest, and most first officers in Starfleet are, you know, their their career ambition is to be a starship captain themselves. But is it fair to say that that's not uh, Goodspeed's ambition at all? Yeah, I, I was going to be a chief designer engineer, like one of the ones who actually gets to design spaceships. Uh, but, you know, a few months ago, uh, one of the admirals, a mentor of mine, told me it wasn't really my turn, and... Usually the chief design people, they want, to, they want them to have experience out in the field. Um, and I'm not really the deployment type, or at least I didn't want to be, but this is something I want to do. So if I want to be a chief designer, if I wanted to design my own starship, 
I was going to have to do a rotation in the field, and that's okay. So he signed me up for the Starfleet mid-level officer rotation program, uh, the SMORC program, uh, ro officer Smork. rotation for command. Uh, and so, I love that you came up with the acronym for it. That's oh, awesome. yeah. Yeah, and uh, I get to work on the bridge of a starship so that I understand how the vehicle works. And I'm not exactly super-duper thrilled, but um, Admiral Champion has never really led me astray, so here, here I am. I really do. I truly love like that that whole construction because I don't think we've ever seen. Uh, I don't think we've ever had a character in any of the Star Trek iterations, of the TV shows, or anywhere in the franchise, where there was like a first officer who wasn't, uh, you know, out there because oh, I'm, I'm, you know, like a Riker type. You know, I guess Spock was like didn't care about command, but he still wanted to be out on the frontier and and doing all that great exploration stuff. But Goodspeed is genuinely like, no, I, I don't want to be out here. I want to be behind a desk. Yeah, next I don't. To Earth. I don't want to be. I want to be in an office. Yeah. yeah, like I, like I don't. I can't think of a time where we've had a character in kind of the position that Goodspeed is in that was like, no, I don't want to be in the center chair at all. That's that's not what I'm. Yeah. That's not what my ambition is. No, nope, I, I am have to kind of check this box before I can go back to doing what I actually want to do. That's exactly it. I just want to. Yeah, I just want to do my time and uh, be done. That's such a cool dynamic that has never actually been touched on in Star Trek before. So I'm super thrilled that you came up with that. Yeah. Does Goodspeed have like a um, a personal biggest failure either in their career or their life that they kind of um, regret or ruminate over, or that they would go back and do a second time if they could? I wish I wish I would have paid more attention in some of the classes on leadership and field deployment stuff because you know. I know I'm not going to be out here forever, but it would be nice if I had a little bit more base of experience there uh, and paid a little bit more attention to that. One of the questions that I kind of want to get everybody down on the record about is how they feel about the Prime Directive. Uh, I'll I haven't really ever been challenged on it yet because I've mostly, like I said, been trying to spend time behind a desk when I can. But yeah, um, yeah I th I'm a firm believer that the Prime Directive gets in the way. Um, if okay. I go to a planet where people are suffering because they don't have clean water, I will, you know, if nobody's watching me, I'm going to give them a filtration system. Like, why wouldn't I? Okay. Um, is it going to change their future? Maybe. So is anything. Uh, one other way to change their future is to have a lot of their, pa a lot of their people die because of unclean water. That's not. I don't see that as a noble thing. So, if there is an engineering problem to be solved, that we have solved, I don't. I don't see what the big deal is in in handing out the solution if it's going to make people's lives better. There's probably a slippery slope there, but at the yeah, there's a lot of people who will rather you know cut off their nose to spite their face when it comes to prime directive stuff, and I am not one of those. Okay, but again, because of what Goodspeed's career has been up to this point, there hasn't really been a situation which that's actually been challenged. Is that right? That is correct. Does Does Goodspeed feel that a lasting peace with the Klingons is possible, or does he expect that once the treaty is up, the Klingons are going to go back to their old ways and Starfleet's just going to end up in another war? I do. Um, I think a lasting peace is possible. I think the whatever conflicts that will certainly happen in six years' time. Um, will be less than they would have been if we'd started just shooting each other 50 years ago. And how does he feel about the situation with the Cardassians? I've never seen a fight where one guy punches another guy and then they're like, well, that was it, we're done. You know, <laughs> um, it always, the fight either escalates or it ends because of some outside force. And there's no not a lot of outside forces that are big enough to affect the relationships between uh, the Federation and the, and, uh, and the Cardassians. So I don't think that the right thing to do is to do some sort of first strike to show them what's up. Uh, I don't think that that's going to solve anything. Um, what's the right answer? I don't know. I don't spend a whole lot of time. This is probably the first time I've ever thought about it that deeply. Again, you're a desk guy, so you've yeah, never been I don't, out on the frontier I don't, dealing I mean, with this stuff. I, I see stuff in the news, but yeah, I don't spend a whole lot of time thinking about it. Talk a little bit about who Teal is. Yeah. We, literally, we'll just start with what's her name. 
Uh, Dr. Aurora Teal. She's a Betazoid. Full-blooded Betazoid. Full-blooded Betazoid. So she yeah. has telepathic um, abilities. Yes. So she's not just an empath like Troy who can sense right. feelings. She can she's sense also a telepath. Thoughts. Yeah, yeah. And she is the doctor. In Star Trek Adventures, there's a mechanic with uh, supporting characters. The player will have a specific character, but then there's also kind of a roster of, you know, recurring guest stars, things. Right. And we started to build that out, but at the beginning, I didn't want you guys to have to worry about that. So I said, okay, everybody's kind of two jobs. Yeah. Except for Ryan. Right. Um, so at the beginning, Dr. Teal was both the doctor and the science officer. We, we might move away from that at some point. But I think we're still, as of this recording, I think yeah, Teal's still, still, still basically both. doing the both. Yeah. But again, it's Star Trek, so the main characters will be in the landing party always. Sure. That's just the way it works. Yeah. The other thing I really like about the Star Trek Adventure system is the way you build a character. So in D&D, you sort of you come up with your backstory, but then you just have a bunch of categories and you dump a set number of points into them, into oh. intelligence or whatever. Okay. What's interesting about the way Star Trek Adventures does it is it leads you kind of down a storytelling life path yeah, that, that you make cool. choices of. Mm -hmm. And then your points go into different categories based on the story choices that you make, yeah. which I thought was really cool. Yeah. Uh, and it gives you a bunch of different options. Um, so, and I, I legit don't remember what you picked, but some of them are like your, the environments you grew up in, like a home world or an isolated colony, mm -hmm. kind of upbringing you had, whether it was around Starfleet or, you know, artistic um, stuff. Um, did, did you want me to expound on those things? Yeah, or? well just, if you remember, if you have Should, them, yeah, have, like yeah. um, um, pick one or two that you feel very interesting. Uh, from my background, uh, my kind but firm parents <laughs> uh, raised me in a Betazoid colony, and uh, my parents' careers in diplomacy and politics were boring, and I wanted to know more about the inner workings of creatures, which led me to science and biology. More about and life itself. Yeah, more yeah. about that and less about paperwork and politics. So, okay. Yeah. Um, and then the the end of that life path kind of uh, process is you pick two events that happened in your career before mm -hmm. the start of whatever the campaign is. Do you have those in front of you? Um, yeah, I had. Uh, well, first was first contact with a with a, an alien race called the Mandragorans, <laughs> and um, seeing them um, after. Um, some detrimental thing had happened to them, the wounded were the ones that arrived on our planet, and so I was helping to treat all these wounded Mandragorans, and it um, gave me the ability to use my empathy and telepathy to see what was going on with them in order to um, communicate with them and help them, and so it was, it showed me that the skills that I was born with were applicable to medicine, um, more more than just medicine itself you know? okay um and the other um background thing was um my uh my friend uh dr evans dr lily evans for those <laughs> geeks up um dr evans uh was a teacher at starfleet and had asked me to come back and teach and i did for a while i taught at starfleet medical for 10 years and then uh, Dr. Evans had moved on, but she was in an accident and came under my care. And I hesitated on a procedure that could have saved her, uh, but would have left her paralyzed. And in the time that I hesitated, she passed away. So that was, it, it led me down a path of like, hesitation is the worst thing ever. And, mm. you know, so it sort of made me more of a like, well, what can we do? And can we do it right now? Kind of a person, Yeah, which is how you know you end up a puzzle solver that's yeah. <laughs> how you're like well, well wait 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 did we look at all the things can we you know what can we do instead of this and and did you did you come up with that aspect specifically because you, you know, said a little bit earlier that you didn't want to be the uh you know i'm a girl i don't know what i'm doing yeah and kind you're sort of. of like working that counter energy into your character yeah i wanted to find a reason that she was not just like, well, I'm a doctor and I'm whatever just you want. here doing whatever thing. And, yeah. But to, ha to have something big that had happened in her past that that affects how... Per I mean, I personally have a trauma in my past that has affected how I, you know, interact yeah. with people and children on a daily basis. And, yeah. like, it, it, changes, it changes things about you and about a, a character. So I wanted something big in the past that would really affect decision-making and that's awesome. Like the fact that you kind of you could take a step back and view yourself as a 
who you were as a player mm -hmm. and go, how can I work to better that or improve that or, you know, confront that? Yeah. And how do I work that into the imaginary character that I'm building? It's awesome. Thanks. It's so good. Thanks. Um, okay. And I was an actress, you know. <laughs> well. Um, and then, okay, beyond, so that's everything that would have come up in the kind of the book the game prescribes here's your character okay i had i had written a bunch of of questions mm -hmm. to help like give you guys prompts you know and never needed to do all of them or write an essay on all of them although sure. i know you're a ravenclaw <laughs> <laughs> so you felt it intrinsic i did one uh, piece of parchment per answer yeah you, you felt a compulsion <laughs> to write a, a five-page essay yeah. on each we're not going to do that here. okay okay um, <laughs> how does she feel about the situation with the klingons teal would fall on the side of not to, but mostly because of her background with seeing all these wounded mandragorans appear and mm. like having to help them after horrible things had happened to them. I, I think she would want to avoid creating that kind of chaos. But, but I mean, but if if doing go it with first, either side, yeah, like if doing it first prevented that chaos prevented from happening, that from the art, from yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, but as a doctor and an empath, I don't think you would want to be the the attacker. You know, like it's not a that's that's not her set of values. Like that yeah. wouldn't be even her if it personally. felt like even if it felt logical. Right. Her heart. She would never be able to make that decision based on right. what was in her heart. Right. Yeah. I, I think she wouldn't. She wouldn't say like, yeah, we should take them down. Like that's not that's not who she is as a person. Yeah. Um, or has a beta joint. What does she think about the Cardassians and the Bajorans? If we can help, we should. And that's based both on her life's mission of saving lives and being in the medical field and being able to, like, feel what they're going through and their pain and empathizing with them and, you know, things like that. And, like, as far as the Prime Directive goes, it's a... It's such a tricky matter, and... There are some that, yeah, are 100%. Are you never, ever, ever break the Prime Directive. And there are, I think Teal would fall more in the, like, well, <laughs> meh. If we can get away with it here. Yeah, then yeah. I, th if, if it will do more good than harm. Yeah. And if, if people are being oppressed like that and something like that, and we have the ability to help and to make a difference in the lives of all of those people, like, and if the Cardassians are, like, about to attack anyway like if it, if all of that is inevitable saving lives of another species i think would fall into her like that's probably a good idea pile <laughs> but then then the risk becomes so in the moments before war with the cardassians happens mm -hmm. if you have to make a choice between helping bajorans who very clearly need it and could use it yeah and who would benefit from your help right at the risk of provoking the Cardassians into war, which might cause a huge amount of misery and destruction. Right. But then it becomes like a needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few yeah. question. It's, Do mm. the needs of the many in the Federation outweigh the needs of the few on Bajor? Yeah. Ugh. I don't know. This is why she hates politics. <laughs> <laughs> she just wants to help. And that's, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. I love it so much. <laughs> Tell us about uh, Nick Holden. I was born on a remote trading planet out near the neutral zone. I uh, got my hands on a lot of weird technology, sort of had to teach myself how to integrate different things and improvise things, so kind of kept the, the work going. The reason I grew up on this outskirt planet is because my grandparents were in the Federation and got displaced during the, the Federation Klingon War. So their starbase was actually destroyed, and they came and landed on this planet, and that's where my um, father's side of the family comes from. So between sort of them and my mother's stories of Starfleet, I just have a real core of, I believe in Starfleet. So I think Starfleet is sort of the greater good. Um, sometimes you have to get your hands dirty, but for the most part, the philosophy behind Starfleet is sort of my main thing in life. I want to make a difference. I want to make things better. Did really well in Starfleet Academy academically. Uh, socially had some problems. Didn't really get super close with very many people. Uh, graduated. Um, ended up getting a job in Starfleet Intelligence. Uh, basically, just my grades were so good. I uh, didn't have a whole lot of connections, so I just kind of joined them. Uh, didn't always agree with what I was doing, 
when I was quitting my position out of the the intelligence facility, I saw I saw Maddox was a captain and was like, hey, I I enjoyed working with him. He seemed like a guy I could trust. So if I want to try and get out there and actually just do some good for once, uh, I would try and get there. So I pulled in some strings, uh, some of the favors that I had accumulated over the years, and got assigned as the uh, chief engineer. Okay. Is there a um, a decision or a mistake or any particular like moments from Holden's uh, life or background that he regrets more than anything else that he would ch- maybe go back and change if he had the opportunity or that he you know really colors how he makes decisions or looks at things in the present day no nah, I don't think so I'm sort of not of someone who looks back and thinks like oh if I could have done this differently it is what it is and we move forward even if you know maybe he took a risk at some point in his life and it didn't pan out, you know he still says, "Well, I still made the right decision, even if it if that situation didn't turn out the way I you know maybe wanted it to." Yeah, I mean, I you I I make the right decision. So <laughs> okay, and he's very confident in his own uh, decision making ability. Yeah, uh, I mean, I I spent twenty years, and like, of course, I've made mistakes. I'm not saying like I never make up, make a mistake or anything like that. But like, yeah. on the whole, I'm pretty. I've done a lot of really good work, and I know that I have. And now this is um, Holden's first tour of duty on an actual starship. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, this is the this is the first time Starfleet has acknowledged my direct assignment to a ship. And the reason I ask is to ask about how Holden feels about the Prime Directive and whether or not he has ever been in a situation where his views on that might have been challenged so no to the challenge part simply because no holden does not necessarily put that particularly in high regard okay. um and i have not really faced a lot of situations in my career in which like i had to decide whether to stop a drought because i gave them technology that would allow them to combat that um, all the situations that i've generally dealt with is like something is happening that's terrible and maybe giving them a, an alien race a piece of technology will help stop an atrocity at which point the prime directive starts to fall away and you do that enough times you start to go i get the idea behind the prime directive but in really extreme situations it's not something we need to worry about type of thing so okay i get it i, I i'm not gonna say like let's just go around and start sending um fusion drives to people that are still using riding horses and stuff Uh, because that's basically just illogical and that's going to cause all sorts of problems again but in terms of like we have to try and appear to the or adhere to the prime directive all the time not something that i'm generally worried about and what do you think about peace or war with the klingons i don't necessarily think that thinking that they're just going to go back to war if they if they can is a is a wrong assumption i think that that's probably going to be what happens i'm also not one of a um major first strike type of problem i think they're things you can do to help prepare for war and to maybe help alleviate war with maybe just some minor collateral damage here and there um there are ways to to influence that sort of thing without necessarily going out on all war i don't believe in the idea of a normal first strike capability of let's go and start destroying their ships um with other ships in like some sort of open conflict i think that that's a negative thing um as for do I think it's inevitable that we go to war? I don't know that that's true. I think if we can maneuver our way and utilize some sort of soft pressure and, and Cold War tactics, maybe we can get through without going into open war with them. And that would be my hope. And what do you think about peace or war with the Cardassians? My impression of them is, yeah, we're going to end up going to war with them. Uh, they're gearing up for it. Also, like, we should do everything we can to avoid war, but since it seems inevitable, it kind of is what it needs to be. Uh, they're they're currently occupying a planet and oppressing its people and I'm not about that again the Federation doesn't do that the reason the Federation exists is to stop things like that I think the Federation should be exerting all of its diplomatic covert and other types of pressures to try and avoid war but also like the Cardassians need to be stopped they need they aren't they aren't in a place that is helpful to the galaxy and the hope is that we can change their minds and undermine the problems that they have within their union without going to war but if we do we just need to win it if the federation decided to go in and kick them out i'd be all behind it i think that if okay. that was the decision that the intelligence services uh and diplomatic services came to that 
we just do it and we do it hard we do it fast we get it done and we win i mean the point is we need to liberate it we need to make those people free the question is like are we do what are we doing right now can we doing more and at what point do we say this stuff isn't going to work anymore and that's just not my department anymore now uh, so holden isn't the isn't the captain but theoretically hypothetically if he were and the the tempest were in a situation where basically they had to make a, a game time call as about like okay are we are we going to go to war with the Cardassians? are we going to open fire or are we going to do whatever that's going to then raise this to an all-out actual war um do you do you have a feeling of like what kind of decision holden would make in in that moment i i don't to be perfectly honest i don't care about the greater ramifications whatever situation we're in if it's a situation that requires us to fire on them um to save lives or to protect people that otherwise are going to get um like slaughtered or whatever like if it's something wrong that they need to be fired upon i'm not necessarily worried about the, the large-scale ramifications because that means at that point that we are there and so, so whatever like diplomatic fallout would happen holden doesn't care about that he, he cares about what's in front of him and doing the right thing with what's in front yep. of him and however the chips fall yeah i'm aware of it and like i'm not gonna again it has to be a situation that actually calls for it if there are other ways yeah, yeah. out there i'm certainly going to look for them i'm not looking to just fire on everybody but I don't have hesitation if I feel like that's the course of action that needs to happen. I'm not going to be like, well, this is going to cause some diplomats some more drama. So you, you, basically Holden doesn't care if he makes a whole lot of diplomats mad at him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I haven't, I haven't cared up to this point. I'm not going to care now. So let's just start with the easy basics. What's the, your name and your character's position on the ship? Uh, Maddox of the Starship Tempest. Captain Rajay Maddox. Captain Rajay Maddox. Okay, and you are a half Andorian, half human, right? Correct. Which is cool. I don't think we've ever seen one like that before. Correct. Although, by appearance only, I uh, Maddox appears almost entirely human. Um, and there is a, a backstory to that if you want me to get yeah, into now. Yeah, jump not. right into it. Yeah, so Rajay Maddox is half Andorian. A uh, fact he actually didn't even discover until he was in his adolescence. But he was surgically altered to look even more human than he had originally. So he doesn't have any antenna. He is basically human colored, except maybe a little bit on the light side, but certainly not as stark uh, white and blue as a, a Endorian would be. So he looks human. And this is actually, I, I love this aspect of it because it's something I don't think we've ever seen in Star Trek before, but it's because Maddox is the product of infidelity, right? Your uh, father had an affair, or I should, Maddox is father had an affair with an Andorian Starfleet officer, is that right? Correct. The bottom line is yes, they, he and uh, Maddox's parents were on assignment at uh, a Starfleet base in close proximity and contact with Andorians and his father had an affair with an Andorian. Maddox was the result and they kept that secret from him until he was uh, in his adolescence. Now the, the important thing here is that his who he thought was his real mother, his adopted mother, actually became the strongest figure in his life because despite the fact that he was the, the personification of his, his father's infidelity, she never treated him as anything other than, than a true son. And so their bond is really, really strong. His ties to his father were very shaky for a while, but with the guidance of his adoptive mom, who for simplicity's sake would say his mother, through the, with the guidance of his mother, he has regained at least some sort of uh, cordial relationship with his father. Uh, and she was in Starfleet, right? And that was kind of the inspiration for Maddox to join Starfleet. That's correct. Right? She was on base. She was. They were on on a Starfleet assignment because she was in Starfleet. Her, his father wasn't, and uh, but that is why Maddox ended up going into Starfleet was because again, she, he and she are so close, and he she is his inspiration. Uh, okay, and so Maddox went to the academy. <clears throat> uh, he eventually rose through the ranks to become uh, the first officer of a starship. Uh, and at that point, uh, we have one of the events that you picked as your like uh, your career event in your life path creation, right? Correct. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Uh, the Ilshan? Yeah. So uh, during his uh, tenure as executive officer of the Bantu Wind, um, he was the crew of the Bantu Wind was sent to... Uh, help uh, evacuate a small scientific colony from, I believe, an asteroid or a dwarf planet to uh, be, 
uh, they were sent to evacuate this colony. And during the course of that evacuation process, they received a distress signal from, I believe it was a medical ship? Uh, yeah. But regardless, it was a, uh, yeah, it was a medical, medical transport. A medical transport ship, an Andorian medical transport ship called the Ilshan, which which had over 300 patients and crew on board. And Maddox's point to his executive, his point to his captain was, we can leave the the colony on the surface of this of this uh, planetoid and get back in time to rescue them and save the Ilshan uh, crew. The captain disagreed, and because it was his first assignment as first officer, he didn't object any further. He made his case known and then just backed off. And as a result, almost everybody on the Ilshan died, and when and the total crew complement of the small colony was 16, I think, scientists and officers. So he traded 16 lives for 300, and it's something that really haunts him. So he's vowed never to let his gut instinct He's learned to listen to his gut. Eventually, <coughs> after that, he gets promoted, and uh, his first command is the USS Chalice. While you were captain of... So this was the second kind of career event in your life path thing that you picked was uh, from your time as captain of the Chalice. You want to talk about that? Uh, so this was a... Which, by the way, I'm, I've said this to you before, but I'm so mad I didn't think of it because this is a great idea for an episode. Yeah. It, uh, I, it's such a Star Trek episode thing. Um, the... So the crew of the Chalice beams down to some planet, and when they return to the Chalice, it seems at first like they're speaking nonsense, nonsensical about these things or these beings. Or The bottom line is eventually through, through study, the chief medical officer of the Chalice realizes that their brainwaves have been hijacked by these quantum beings. So these quantum beings literally only exist when the crew who is infected by them is thinking of them. So effectively, if the crew stops thinking of them, the, the entities die. It was determined by the doctor that an induced coma would cure the crew because they'd stop thinking about these, these creatures, which we uh, went on to call the figments, which is a reference to a play that we all did when we were in college together. <laughs> Which I thought was a nice, <laughs> nice loop nice in. Um, but so she, she, she called these creatures the uh, figments, and the figments would pass uh, or die or cease to exist once the medical coma was induced. And Maddox had that gut feeling again, and he's like, "If we do this, we're essentially murdering these creatures who very well may have their own source of intelligence, maybe intelligent creatures. They certainly seem to be." It's not their fault that we beamed down to their planet and they got addicted to or caught in our brainwaves. Um, so he ordered his science, engineering, and medical teams to, uh, to come up with a solution. And what they did was they modified tricorders, because that's what you do in Star <laughs> Trek, to um, upload uh, basically a, an experimental yet advanced AI that would broadcast on the same frequencies that human brainwaves would, would circulate on. It's very much kind of like this, the, the ship in the bottle episode, when they basically create a miniature holodeck that has a seemingly endless amount of adventures for Moriarty and his wife to, to, to live out. This is the same, the same sort of thing. Presumably, I'm guessing, the conclusion of the episode is they actually just they, they get them on this, and it's a lifeboat until they can get them back down to the planet's surface where they can go you know, on their merry way as they had before. So, as we've already said, your character's name is Maddox, and we know that there is another character already established in canon named Maddox, and now it is the idea that uh, your character is related to Bruce Maddox in some way, or has some connection to the cyberneticist that will eventually have opinions about whether or not Data is a person or not. When I decided to go with the last name Maddox, I did immediately think of Commander Maddox from uh, Measure of a Man, and I thought... Well, that's okay. It's still it's just a cool name. <laughs> I yeah. want to go with it. There are more. Um, there can be more than one the person seed in the was, with the same name. Of course, yeah. but the seed was planted that, uh, and it wasn't until I wasn't going to bring it up because I didn't know this is my first role playing game ever, um, so I didn't know what the rules were. But I was glad. I was grateful when you suggested. <laughs> oh, is, is he related to Commander Maddox? Which we actually have the Discord <laughs> chat up in front of us because oh. it's where your bio is. 
<laughs> and so you post your whole bio, and then my the next immediate thing I say <laughs> is that question. <laughs> it's the very first thing I ask about based on your bio. Yeah. Uh, so um, yeah. so we sort of came uh, came to the agreement together that yes, eventually we would sort of try to tie in um, Maddox's lineage with, uh, or I should say, uh, yeah, Commander Maddox's lineage yeah. back to Bruce uh, Maddox to Rise Maddox. Maddox. Correct. And you and I will figure that out together before I build any stories based around that. And how does he feel about the situation with the Klingons? I believe Maddox thinks war is archaic and never an efficient tool towards peace. It is sometimes inevitable, it is sometimes unavoidable, but one should never go head forth into it and certainly never be proactive for it. So if there's legitimate evidence, then that would be a, a reason to act, but until that point, uh, no hostile action taken by the Federation. And the Bajorans? He thinks it's atrocious. What's what would because I would think it was atrocious. So he would think it too. The the, the, the crimes are, are are horrible and should be. I don't know. If uh, yeah. One cannot sit idly by while horrible things are happening to people who are innocent. So I do think he believes the Federation should act there. Okay. Cool. I mean, it might not come up. So. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and what about the Prime Directive? He has never had a truly direct um, moment where his he, he had to decide, should I break the Prime Directive, should I not? That being said, he understands the quantum reality of if you, mm -hmm. if you observe something, you change it. Mm -hmm. So Starfleet has a wonderful history of spying on primitive cultures. He believes the, the second you even observe a, a planet, you have already altered their, their course, potentially, at least. The potential okay. is there. So he understands what the meaning, what the spirit behind the Prime Directive is, but he is not afraid to, to argue the counterpoint if he thinks he trusts his, his gut yet again. And he, he needs feels to, the situation warrants it. Correct. Does your character have an ultimate ambition for their career in Starfleet? Does, does Maddox want to be an admiral someday? No, I don't think he has any any desire. I think when he got into the in, into Starfleet, it was on the table. But the more he, he he doesn't like dealing in politics very much. So the more he realized he he's he's happy being on the front lines. Has Maddox ever either disobeyed a direct order or lied to a superior officer? Oh God, yeah. Oh wow, oh, that yeah. was real confident, and no hesitation. Hundred percent. Okay. Do you want to? Do you have anything specific in mind, no. or do you not want to go into it? No. Okay. Interesting. That would be really interesting. Okay, that's it for the player interviews. Now it's time to start the campaign. Ooh.